hopefully you can hear me over the rain. It is a miserable day and I am in my car about to drive home and that means I get to start listening to an audiobook. I found they've really helped my productivity when it comes to reading over the last few months and it makes me feel like the journey is more worth it. It just feels like an economic use of time. On the menu today we have the last 30 minutes of The Handmaid's Tale by Margaret Atwood. I have spoiled myself I think on the ending by watching the majority of the first season of the TV show but I still want to finish the audiobook just to wrap it up and to say that I've finished. I'm hoping that it's going to last me the whole drive otherwise I'm going to have to faff trying to change over to music for the end. A few moments later. I thought I had 30 minutes left turns out it was just like the research bit at the end so there we go I didn't even notice that I'd finished it the last time I read it um I will still give my thoughts when I get home. <laughs> That's funny. So instead I'm going to be listening to Famous Adopted People by Alice Stevens on Scribd. Starting a new book. Let's go. I guess it makes sense. It's a Monday. It's a new book. It's a new week. Let's get to it. Let's talk about The Handmaid's Tale. So I listened to the audiobook and I feel like now that I'm doing this I'm realizing that audiobooks whilst they're great for your reading productivity they also add this extra layer to your review and they affect how you enjoy a text in a different way based on the reader that you have. So the reader of Winter by Ali Smith, for example, absolutely correct, just right. The reader for The Handmaid's Tale. She was doing this like breathy sort of whispery tone throughout like half of it, which I mean, I guess it's part of the soundscape of the of the dystopian world, women being silenced sort of thing. Uh, but it just really grated me. Like, I don't need my narrators to be doing so much acting. I wasn't a huge fan of that. And also this is largely told using passive voice, or at least the first half is. And again, that's just like world affirming. Um, it's a good device to use to illustrate the world that we're in, which is one where women's rights have basically been taken away and they've become walking wombs. So the passive works well for that, but it's like my least favourite thing ever. <laughs> I think you can tell by the fact that I didn't even realise that I'd finished the book, that it didn't have that like really big punch of an ending <laughs> I was expecting. Um, and I think overall I'm enjoying the TV show more. The TV show also moves very quickly and I like how it cuts back between her old life. Um, one thing, and I've read this in other reviews, uh, it's quite hard to see how we could get to this world. It explains it in the book that basically there's a big shoot up at the White House and then because all of these politicians are dead that means that women are now subservient and all of their money is taken from their bank accounts they're not allowed to have jobs anymore. And I was like it's just a bit of a big leap isn't it? I think maybe the steps there, I feel like it's too soon. Uh, unlike a lot of dystopians where you're following the characters years into this dystopian future, The Handmaid's Tale is like she is there for the change like that's part of the that's half of her narrative basically um going back and saying what her life was like before and then how things were slowly like started to be unsettling and then became literally going into like women's camps I just felt like there would be more to it than what it was um for some reason because it's such like in the zeitgeist everyone sort of knows The Handmaid's Tale. Basically I thought it would be more, more everything, more shocking, I don't know, or maybe more rebellious. Um, I really couldn't say what I was looking for from this text. I know there's a sequel now, The Testaments, which only came out a few years ago and my library has that so I may uh, go ahead and read it but it's certainly not a priority. Like I expected to be blown away by this but I really wasn't. Once again we meet in my car with a drastic change of weather. It's so nice now, it finally feels like May. And I'm continuing on with Famous Adopted People. I think I read like a chapter and a half yesterday and it was basically just a lot of, of setup. The beginning opens with a fight between two best friends, which always seems weird when you're like swearing at each other whilst also being like, and we've known each other forever and I'll always love her. Starts with a friendship breakup. I wonder if there'll be reparations later on. I didn't end up reading on my way in because I was listening to these. As soon as the sun's out, I'm like, let's get those summer hits going. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna read, I'm gonna make an effort to read on my way home. Like I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna set it up before I can drive and I'm gonna get my 40 minutes in. But you know, sometimes you just wanna jam to music. And I really put on that performance whenever the traffic lights are red. Like whoever's in front of me gets a little treat in the rear view mirror because I am fully living for those 30 seconds. <laughs> 
I want it noted that I'm leaving the house without a coat. What a beautiful day in British weather. So that's a good thing. Bad thing is, don't really want to read. I think I read like over, well over an hour, like an hour and a half of it yesterday. And that's in times two. So I got through three hours worth of the book. But I just wasn't feeling it. Like it's got weird. I'll talk about it more later. But it's just, it's really like playing with me. End up reading anything on the way in. Because when it's so nice out, again, you just want to have the windows down and be listening to music. So that's what I did. Um, although to be honest, I'm kind of feeling listening to Neozone because Maddie mentioned it earlier. So... It's time I talk about famous adopted people. So I mentioned that this started with a friendship breakup. Two friends are adopted, both having their biological families from Korea. And whilst one friend is interesting and in connecting with her heritage, the other doesn't believe that there's going to be anything waiting for her. Our main character is a teacher in Japan, and she is in a relationship with one of her 17-year-old students. Yikes. And one of the arguments she has with her friend is that the law is catching up to her on that. Ooh. Her friend wants her to use this agency where they can find out about your birth parents. So she goes along with this and it turns out that they have no records of her birth mother, which she thinks is suspicious. Then she meets a very handsome man called Harrison, who is going to take her on a tour around Itawan, which is kind of where they think her mother might have been from. Turns out this man is a honeypot and she falls for his charms, gets roofied and then abducted to North Korea, where she meets her mother, who is a white woman, surprisingly, because that was not what she was expecting, um, who was in a relationship with the North Korean president. I, I think that's what happened. Yeah, it's as crazy as that. We follow her for the rest of the book in captivity with Honey's menagerie of strange people who have all had some elaborate plastic surgery. There's a scene where the main character is forced to have plastic surgery. Um, that was horrific, a forced nose job in excruciating detail. Then it kind of gets like a prison break vibe where she's trying to escape and uh, bargain items on the outside for money. Just so odd and not what I was expecting at all. If you go on the Goodreads, all you can see is people saying, this was a wild ride. And I have to agree, I feel like when you don't have much to say, the best is potentially to say nothing at all and that's where I fall in this book. It has a nice narrative where the main character is a writer and she wants to write about her experiences as an adoptee so she creates a website and that is one of the ways she's able to escape her captivity. So within the book there is this narrative about stories of adoptees and how often it's not told from their perspective so I value that side but I just think all of the crazy hijinks like really took you away from that central point. It's a book that's doing a lot and the thing is it's not even that long and it's another that I don't think I would have read has script not said this is all you have access to. So that's my thoughts on that. I woke up pretty early this morning for a weekend day, but as soon as I looked in the mirror, I was like, woof, my eye bags are not it today. So we'll just have this voiceover. It is a, let's be honest, pretty grotty copy of Never Let Me Go by Kazuo Ishiguro. It's a book that I feel like everyone has read, so I'm catching up. Going into town with a friend later today, so I just had the morning to pick up a library book that I had on reservation. I'm really excited to read it. It's Burnt Sugar by Abney Joshi, and it's from the Women's Prize long list. It didn't make the shortlist, but it's about mother daughters, so I thought I would enjoy it. <laughs> just in the car park now but here is the book so it was a reservations free for all like they'd split the self-service systems into one for taking out and one for returning and then next to the one for taking out was just the reservation shelf and you just picked it up yourself i was kind of worried that it wasn't going to be there because this is like the last day i have to collect it but it was so i can't wait to read this <laughs> and it answers my cry for purple adult books <laughs> if i like it this is so pretty i'd want it in my collection
This is the story of a mother-daughter relationship turned twisted. The back literally says, sometimes I refer to Ma in the past tense, even though she is still alive. I'm grieving, but it's too early to burn the body. And as soon as I read that, I was like, yeah, I definitely want to read this. Tara is the mother and she was sort of a wild, reckless spirit when she was younger. And her daughter was kind of on the ride for the whims of her life. And I think she resented her for probably the unconventional childhood that she had. And now in their adult relationship, the daughter is having to care for her mother, harboring these feelings of resentment, jealousy, knowing that her mother doesn't remember her childhood the same way that she does. So it's about reconciling their memories together and hopefully puzzling out their relationship. Essentially it hits all of my buzzwords so this has suddenly gone to the top of my TBR. Let's review my thoughts on Never Let Me Go. To talk about this book is to spoil it. The premise is the plot and vice versa so if you don't want to hear anything about it then maybe skip this section. We follow three children at Hailsham, a boarding school, and it's a coming of age of the tangling relationships between them, the jealousy, the toxicity but also the comfort and home that they bring each other in this strange place and as they get older we slowly come to realize that they're clones created solely for the purpose of organ doning. I really enjoyed how this revelation creeps up on you throughout the book and it's not given with any sense of impending doom, which is a truly unnerving sense of disconnect. Despite the concept being essentially bodily horror, it's very serene. The whole thing is sort of swathed in this like memory haze that makes it seem nicer than it is. When the characters move into a care facility, they hear rumors about deferrals of if you're in love, then maybe you can defer your organ donors. So then it kind of becomes their quest to do that. And it ends tragically as this could, you know? I really enjoyed the writing style and how much a reflection these characters felt for my own experiences as a child. It sounds terrible to say that I related to Ruth and Kathy's actions, but the way that they played each other and were mean-spirited at times without truly meaning it, but still being friends, it, it just felt like a true siblings relationship in a way. Parts felt so drawn from real life, it was almost as if my memories had come to life in this book. I liked the book more than the film, which I watched basically immediately after finishing it. I'm not a huge Kerry Mulligan fan though so maybe I was slightly shaded because of that. There was something about seeing it play out on screen that made it more horrific. I came away just feeling so much more unsettled than reading the book even though it's the same story and it is a faithful adaptation it just simplifies it. And they make Tommy who's I guess the top of the love triangle um, more like you want to swaddle him if that makes sense. <laughs> I think this is naturally one of those stories that is hard to forget. So I can see why it's a text now on curriculums to study. And whilst I appreciated what it was doing and how unique the story was, maybe there wasn't anything too shocking. I can see where the criticisms of it being boring come from. Overall, I'm giving it just a middling rating. <laughs> It is so lovely outside that myself and my whole family have been outside reading. I finished off Never Let Me Go, which you've already heard my thoughts on, and I started or picked up, I was like 14 pages through, Strange Weather in Tokyo. And I read the Nekano thrift shop that was part of my wrap up so I'll leave that link in the cards if you want to watch that which I liked but I just thought it was going to have a bit more magical realism or whimsy to it and really it's just very down to earth. This is a kind of romance between a woman in her almost 40s and a man who's much older and used to be her teacher at school. They see each other through happenstance and then that just keeps reoccurring and they start to develop feelings for each other. It's only 170 pages so I definitely plan on finishing this one today and it just feels really good to be getting through my library books. After I'm done with this I plan to read An American Marriage and then I can finally get to Burnt Sugar that I picked up earlier this week. So I finished Strange Weather in Tokyo and again I don't think I liked it as much as I wanted to. Maybe it's the dynamic of a romance being the central plot line that just doesn't interest me as much but I found I liked this less than the Nakano thrift shop just because the surrounding characters weren't as interesting to me. I suppose with such a short book it makes sense that it focuses mainly on Tsukiko and Sensei. I'd say their relationship gets more developed once they've gone on the trip together but it's so unassuming and quiet and you're never like 
are they dating or not? And spoiler alert, it ends very quickly with him dying and then his son being like, you made him happy in the end there. The most interesting bit to me was the conversations she actually had with an old school friend who also had a bit of a crush on one of his female teachers, but then tried to pursue a relationship with Tsukiko. Overall, it just wasn't really my thing. Thank you.